Hi all. So today we'll talk about multiple access protocols or basically ways, methods at the link layer to allow nodes to share the channel. So you can think of it as the share channel being an intersection um, and multiple nodes wanting to traverse it. And then we have the Mac algorithm here that decides who gets to go through at any given time. Ideally, that algorithm should be distributed such that the nodes, or in this analogy, the cars, could decide themselves who gets to go through instead of having a centralized gatekeeper. Um, there are, interestingly enough, methods for cars to talk to each other wirelessly and figure out uh, who should be going through. They're called virtual stoplights, but that's sort of a different problem. It's a medium access protocols for, uh, for vehicles. Here we'll be talking about medium access protocols for packets, uh, sharing an intersection or sharing some shared channel. The trick to this is that um, there can be no out of band communications. So if nodes are using some channel to transmit data, they need to use the same channel to coordinate with each other. They can't have an, an outside channel or, or a separate network for just coordinating. Um, so, what we would like to do is to first set out some parameters or, or desirable properties um, that these MAC protocols, medium access control protocols, would have. So first we'll look at the channel and say that a channel can transmit the rate at the rate of R bits per second. Okay, so then within that, um, we would like that when only a single node transmits, maybe only a single node has data to transmit, that that node can then transmit at the rate R, meaning that it can use the full channel capacity. If there are M nodes in this network and they all have something to transmit, then we would like that the average transmission rate of each node be R over M. Maybe not at every time instance, but if we observe this over a long enough time period, um, we can see that they share that they do two things. One, they share the channel fairly in that each node gets uh, the same transmission rate as every other node, and also that they use the channel rate fully as opposed to, um, you know, the more nodes there are, the less overall capacity of the channel they can, that can, they can use. We would like this protocol to be fully decentralized with no special nodes doing the coordination. That is not always the case, or that's not always desirable. Um, we could have uh, nodes that are being coordinated by, by a special node. Um, for example, an access point, even though Wi-Fi doesn't really use this uh, coordinator approach as much. Um, but for example, in cellular networks, the tower coordinates the transmission of nodes. Um, so having a coordinator isn't always a bad thing. It just depends on the, on the network. Um, what we do want is that there's... Uh, well, I guess that's also questionable, that there's no synchronization of clocks or slots that these nodes can, can agree on. Synchronization is in general expensive to do and difficult to do. Um, technically speaking, actually, it's impossible to, to do it perfectly. So it's much easier to design protocols where we don't require synchronization of clocks. But there are protocols that um, use that to an extent or they have some level of agreement around what's happening when. We'll, we'll get into that in those details. And then finally, we would want this protocol to be simple. Right? If it's complicated, that means uh, that, that there are control packets. Right? What does it mean for it to be complicated? It means it's doing something, which means that the only way to do something without out-of-band communication is to use the shared channel. And then the bandwidth that the nodes should be sharing is instead being eaten up by control traffic. So we would like these protocols to have as little control traffic as possible. OK. So when we talk about medium access protocols um, over broadcast channels, there are basically three approaches. One is to partition the channel. Um, another one is random access. And then finally, we can have a taking turns protocol. So channel partitioning um, would be dividing the channel into some smaller pieces, maybe uh, time slots, maybe frequency, maybe code. We, uh, we didn't talk too much about um, Code multiple access, we'll, we'll touch on it when we talk about uh, wireless networks in general later on. 
um, but it's basically a way to divide the spectrum in some way. The code is actually kind of easy to understand for us, um, and it's basically when you have more than one person speaking at a time in a room, right? Let's say you're in a crowded bar and there are multiple conversations going on. Usually, if there aren't too many conversations that are loud, we can tune in to someone's voice and follow it while tuning out everything else. Um, something similar can be done in the network with the effect that if there are more transmitters, it becomes more and more difficult to tune into a particular transmission and recover its bits without loss. Frequency division is obviously having nodes choose their own frequency to transmit in. Um, and the key to these channel partitioning protocols is to allocate some resources to some nodes for their exclusive use. So once that allocation has been done, it's not always easy to do, but once it has been done, then the nodes can use it without worrying about um, it, it their transmissions interfering with somebody else and vice versa. Okay, Random access is another approach where the channel is not divided and we in fact can tolerate collisions when two nodes or two people start transmitting at the same time. So there is some mechanism to allow for recovery from transmissions where you need to detect them and then you need to have a method for retransmitting the, the lost data. Um, and a good example for this would be something that happens in the video chat through WebEx where you know I open the channel and I say, hey, do you guys have any questions? And then often more than one person jumps in and then you guys back off and then finally someone you know gets the floor to speak. And finally, there can be a uh, taking turns protocol um, where nodes can coordinate to take turns speaking or take turns transmitting. And this is something that happens in an in-person conversation where one person speaks, there is some social cues that indicate the end of the transmission, which allows the other person to, to then say what they have to say. Okay, so those are the three general approaches and now we can look at uh, protocols that establish, that rely on these methods within a network. All right, so I already talked about uh, TDMA, which is time division multiple access, FDMA, frequency division multiple access. I don't think I need to go over this again here. Um, so let's move on to random access protocols. Okay, so random access is basically nodes deciding to transmit when they want to transmit um, and, and transmitting, I guess. Um, Whenever a node starts transmitting, they will transmit at the full data rate R, basically the rate of the link. And there is no a priori coordination among nodes, meaning that a, when a node decides to transmit, it doesn't have any knowledge of other nodes transmitting or not transmitting, um, and they don't kind of coordinate before anybody transmits. When there is a transmission of two or more nodes at the same time, this is a collision, in which case the receiver cannot, in general, uh, decode the data transmitted by either one of the transmitters. And so the question is then how to detect these collisions and how to recover from them by retransmitting data um, at a more favorable time. And examples of this would be slotted Aloha and Aloha, which we'll cover in a second, as well as uh, carrier sense multiple access um, uh, with collision detection and collision avoidance that um, I'll talk about in a second. Okay, so the first one is slotted Aloha. And this is the, one of the first kind of data wireless protocols. This was developed in uh, University of Hawaii back in the day, as you can see from, this, from these images, um, basically in the 70s. And the idea there was to create a link, um, a wireless link between the different um, islands in Hawaii and use those links to transmit data. And this protocol was designed, that the idea for this network was to be ad hoc, where nodes transmitted when they transmitted, and if they collided, oh well, we try again, and even though there are collisions, over time we can still get a decent transmission rate. Um, the question was, you know, does this work? How decent a transmission rate did we get? Uh, can this be a, a, a functioning network? Okay, so... The way they approached the problem is they said, okay, we're going to assume, we'll look at slotted Aloha first, which is a little bit easier to understand. Um, it's actually the second protocol they came up with. But 
what you have is all frames, all data frames being transmitted have the same size. Okay, so you can basically divide time into these slots during which transmission can happen. Now, the problem with this you'll notice is that there is some coordination because each node needs to know when a slot starts. Um, so this can be treated as a strong assumption, but let's just kind of assume that that can be done somehow. Okay, um, so times divided into equal time slots and these nodes are synchronized as I mentioned. Okay, so if two or more nodes transmit in a slot, okay, we're gonna assume that this is a collision. Okay, so we have a collision here, we have a collision here, we have a collision here. It's also possible that nodes don't transmit in any slot, this is an empty slot, or that only one of them does and that is deemed a success, meaning that someone can decode this data because it's not obscured by some other data being transmitted at the same time. Okay? So we can then ask, okay, what is the efficiency of this protocol? Right? We would like, if there's three nodes, that each of them gets uh, R over three bandwidth, but does that actually happen? So the nodes transmit in some in a slot if they have the ability to, if they have data to transmit with a probability P. Okay? So they can choose to transmit or not transmit. Now, a transmission is successful if no other nodes transmit in the same time slot. Okay, so the probability that the other n minus one nodes don't transmit, it's one is one minus p to the n minus one. All right. So then the probability of a successful transmission is p times so that the node does transmit and all times one minus p to the n minus one, meaning that the other nodes don't transmit. That makes for a successful transmission. Right? So for n nodes. That's n times p times 1 minus p to the n minus 1, which is basically the efficiency of the channel. Now, we can grab this for different sizes of the network and for different values of p. So we can configure this network with some number of nodes and a probability p, the probability of transmission in any time slot p. Okay? And you can see that as we move to, as we have fewer nodes, okay, the efficiency of this channel increases and the efficiency of this network increases, meaning that more slots are successes and um, yeah, and if we have um, more nodes, then the probability of transmission has to be smaller to reach the maximum efficiency for, for a network of a, of a given size. This isn't a great protocol, but it does show some interesting things. If you have the ability to coordinate nodes such that they transmit in slots and they follow this protocol, you can use your channel efficiency becomes, you know, between 0.35 and point, I don't know, 0.42 or something, right? Which is kind of decent. It's not terrible. Um, if you're trying to build a network and you get, you know, a 10 gigabit per second link, you're getting 0.4 gigabits per second, which is still pretty good. Um, but the challenge is that for a given network of a network of a certain size, you need to set the P and there are still, it's still not, it's still only 0.4, right? It's still not great. So we can look at a different protocol, which may be a little bit easier to build, which is the pure aloha or the unslotted uh, version. And so in this version, there is no synchronization. Instead of transmitting packets or frames at certain times by all the nodes, now any node can transmit their frame at any given time, basically whenever it feels like it. Um, would that be more efficient or less efficient? Okay, well, let's see what happens. So for a node to transmit a frame, okay, there has to be no transmission that starts within the duration of the frame before. Okay, so we should have added that a node, a transmission can happen at any time, but all the frames are still of the same size. Okay, so if you do transmit, you only get to transmit for um, some set amount of time. So for there to be no collision with this transmission, no transmission could have started in the previous um, time that it takes to transmit a frame or within that time. 
right? Could have started before that, then it would have, then it would have finished before the yellow node starts. Also, there can be no transmission, no transmission can begin while we are transmitting our frame. Okay, so if our transmission probability is p, okay, that at some point we're going to transmit, um, the probability that other nodes don't is 1 minus p n to the 1 in this time interval. Okay, so the probability of successful tr transmission is p times 1 minus p to the 2 times n minus 1. 2 because we need to worry about this interval and that interval. Okay? So this is the formula for n nodes, and you can see that our channel efficiency drops to, you know, somewhere around 0.2. Okay, so from 0.4, from around 0.4, we went to around 0.2. Right? So obviously you can see how powerful synchronization is um, if it can be achieved within a network. And that requires clocks and some sort of concept in the protocol of when a time slot starts and uh, when one ends and another one begins. Okay, so this is nodes transmitting data blindly into the, into the channel. But what if we could sense the channel before we transmit? So this is analogous to what we do in common speech. If I have something to say, I'm going to first listen and make sure that no one else has anything to say. And if no one else is speaking, then I can begin. But if someone else is talking, I'm not going to just jump in with what I have to say. Okay, so let's say that we have a set of nodes that are connected with a wire, okay? The wire makes things a little bit easier, but let's say they're just connected with a wire or some sort of a, a not a wireless link that is still shared among all these different nodes, basically Ethernet, okay? So what can happen is that this node starts transmitting and as the transmission begins, those electrons travel over the wire towards the other nodes at some rate, right, at some speed, uh, basically their propagation delay, okay? So before the yellow electrons get to this node, this node listens to the channel and says, oh, it looks like no one else is talking. So great, so I can transmit. Now, this node is talking, but the sound or the electrons it's transmitting didn't get to this node yet. So when this node tries to listen to the channel, it looks like the channel is clear, and so it starts transmitting. As a result, there is a collision, and no one can decode the whole data that has been transmitted. All right, so this is a problem. What can we do? Well, if we can hear that someone else is speaking while we're speaking, which is usually what happens in conversation, then we can stop speaking. And the effect of that is that instead of wasting all this time basically finishing the transmission of packets, even though they're already uh, undecodable, if these nodes can realize that they created a collision, they can stop transmitting early, allowing the retransmission to happen earlier, right? so saving some time. So this is basically carrier sense multiple access, meaning that nodes can sense the carrier transmitting the data, with uh, collision detection. Okay, so when collision is detected, they can stop transmitting early. Um, okay, so this is easy to do in um, wired local area networks because um, it's possible to transmit data and receive it or listen to it at the same time, basically listen to what's coming on the wire. In wireless, this is more difficult because you have a radio that is either transmitting data or it has to be switched into receive mode. So it's kind of like either you're using your mouth or using your ears, but you can't use both at the same time. If you can use both at the same time, the fact that you're transmitting is so loud um, that you can't really hear anything over yourself speaking. Now that's not true for human beings. We can both speak and listen at the same time, but in wireless, it's different in that um, there is so much signal loss um, over distance that they basically need to, these nodes need to yell at each other super hard and they can't hear each other um, speaking at the same time. If you want an analogy, it's like if we're in the same room, I can speak and hear what you're saying, but 
if we are yelling at each other from across mountain peaks, I will not be able to hear what you're, what you're yelling to me if I'm yelling at you at the same time. Okay. So the way this works in more detail is that um, the network interface card receives a datagram from the network layer and creates a frame, basically encapsulates the data in a frame. Um, the network card then tries to sense if the channel is idle, if there's no one else speaking, and then if so, starts the transmission. Um, if the channel has been busy, then it basically waits until it's free to start retransmitting. Okay. Um, if the transmission goes through without detection of collision, then we can move on to another frame. But if there is another transmission detected, okay, then we will stop transmitting our packet early, but we will keep sending a jam signal so that the other node can hear that there was a collision as well. There is some period during which the jam signal can, must still be transmitted so that um, everyone can hear that there has indeed been a collision. Okay, so after a collision, there is an, there is an abort of transmission and the network card will enter a binary exponential backup. And this is the interesting part of this mechanism, or I guess another interesting part. So after mth collision, um, the network interface card will choose value k from this set. Okay, so you can see that this set is a kind of a exponential binary um, set that grows larger after a larger number of collisions. We will pick a random value from this, let's say 2, and then the network card will wait k times however long it takes to transmit 512 bits on that channel, how, however much it would have taken to transmit it according to the rate of the channel. Okay? And then, so after collision, that let's say two nodes have been transmitting, they both collided, and they're both doing the back off. They are going to pick some number from this, and hopefully not the same number. If they do pick the same number, they'll back off for the same amount of time to start transmitting again and create a collision again. And so then they will go into another back off, but now M increases, meaning the size of the set increases, meaning that they can, it becomes increasingly less likely that they will pick the same values from the set, right? Just because the set is larger and they're picking a random value from it. Okay, so as the number of collisions increases, they kind of pick up, uh, they have the possibility of delaying longer and longer. And you can, for an analogy, you can think of two people walking towards each other in a corridor and then realizing they need to walk around each other. So, you know, maybe first, uh, one person goes to the right and the other person goes to the left, so they effectively move to the same direction. And they say, oh, dope. And then they move into the other direction at the same time, right? And this happens to you a few times. Eventually, kind of the, the time it takes for one person will take to change direction is going to be increasingly longer and longer and longer until two people decide that one is going to stand and the other one's going to walk around them, All right? So this is something that happens in humans as well. Okay, so let's look at the efficiency of this protocol. Um, to make this simple, I'll just tell you that the formula for this is uh, that, which is 1 over 1 plus 5 times the propagation delay um, over the time of transmission. Okay, so um, tprop is the max propagation delay between two nodes in a LAN, basically how long it takes for one bit to propagate from one end of the network to the other, um, and TTX is the time to transmit um, the maximum size of the uh, of frame allowed in that, in that network, okay? So what we can observe from, from this formula is that the efficiency of this network will go to one if propagation time goes to zero and if transmission time goes to infinity, all right? Why would that be? Well, the propagation time goes to zero, meaning that nodes will be able to detect each other's, each other's transmissions immediately, meaning that one will not start transmitting while it thinks the channel is empty just because the other node's transmission didn't get to it yet. Okay, so if this network is instantaneous in its detection of collisions, then um, 
it's going to be able to avoid collisions altogether and the channel efficiency will be one. The other possibility or the other uh, kind of effect of this formula is that if uh, transmission time goes to one, uh, goes to infinity, this will also tend towards one. And the reason for that is that if a node starts transmitting an infinitely long packet, no one else will be able to transmit, and so there's only one node transmitting forever and ever, which means you have spectral efficiency of one. Okay. And so with that, we can kind of see what happens here as uh, propagation delay goes to uh, zero, right? We end up with channel efficiency of one. And if um, the transmission time gets longer and longer, you can see that the efficiency goes up. All right, so this is um, better performance than Aloha, right? We have higher efficiency than 0.4 in, in a lot of the cases. Um, I guess we need to explore the parameter space but, uh, to see that if it's really better, but um, it, it is. <laughs> um, and uh, it's also cheap, uh, simple, and decentralized. The only problem is that this is only for wired networks, okay? So can do that in wireless, which um, is okay if you don't have a wired network, if you're just using ethernet, but if you have a wired network, this won't work, okay? So what we get to is taking turns protocols. Um, and here's how we kind of arrived, arrived at it. So channel partitioning is great. Um, at a fairly high load, meaning that um, each node gets a fraction of the channel and all the nodes have something to transmit, so all these fractions are utilized effectively. But if the nodes are, all the nodes don't have something to transmit, then each node only uses one out of n bandwidth if only one of them has something to transmit, and so this isn't a very efficient protocol at low load. Okay, the random access MAC protocols are efficient at low load, this is Aloha, right? Because a single node can basically transmit whenever it feels like it. But if you have more nodes or the size of the network increases, you end up having many collisions and the efficiency of the protocol decreases. Okay? So the taking turns protocol could be the best of both worlds, okay? Um, let's look at how a taking turns protocol could be implemented. Let's say we have a bunch of nodes and a, and a coordinator and you have a system or a protocol where uh, the coordinator pulls each uh, node for data, and then if that node has some data, then it gets to transmit, okay? Um, so these nodes are uh, dumb in the sense that they just basically don't coordinate with each other, they just wait for a message, a message from the coordinator, okay? Um, so the problems here with this protocol are pulling overhead, meaning that there's some delay in sending this pull request uh, to these nodes from the coordinator, and um, there's latency in waiting for the pull request to be able to transmit something, and there is a possibility of a single point of failure if this master uh, or this coordinator fails. Okay. So another approach to remove the coordinator is to use token passing, where um, a token or a special packet is being sent around a set of nodes connected using a physical ring or a logical ring, okay? Um, when the token arrives at a node, the node can then see if it has any data, and if so, that node gets to transmit the data um, along the ring. So before Ethernet, there were these uh, token ring networks, IBM was promoting that. Um, these things got pretty expensive because it needed special hardware to see what happens if the token got lost, to recover it, to make sure there's only one token. So eventually Ethernet won out. Um, but again, there is this token overhead that you need to transmit. There is this latency where you need to wait your turn to get the token. Um, and there is still a single point of failure in that the token can be lost at some node when that node has that token. Okay, but anyway, um, in, I guess I should say then kind of more modern uh, networks, there is still a coordinator in cellular networks that decides who gets to transmit when under what conditions. 
Okay, so one example of a network that combines these different principles is your cable network, um, or DAXIS, Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification. And the way this network looks is you have an internet service provider with some routers, um, and to a router is connected cable head end um, with a cable modem trend termination system, or CMTS. Okay, just a basically cable box that then runs uh, instead of an IP line, it runs a cable wire throughout a neighborhood to the different homes. Okay? You might have a splitter here, or you might have a cable modem that, that trans, transforms the cable, um, provides an interface between your computer talking IP and um, the DOCSIS box or the DOCSIS network carrying your IP packets to the cable modem termination system where the IP packets are extracted again and transmitted into the internet. Okay. The interesting thing about this network is that um, you have a division um, based on frequency. Okay, so you have six megahertz here, 6.4 megahertz here for the downstream traffic versus the upstream traffic. So we have frequency division uh, for the different directions of the flows. Okay, so in the down direction, you would have internet frames, TV channels, um, and control. And upstream, you would have um, also internet frames TV control, let's say if you switch a channel, um, and um, yeah, and then it would be transmitted in different time slots. Um, so maybe this isn't if you switch a channel, but there are certain control signals you can send, for example, to order, I don't know, a, a TV show or something like that, right, or a special event. Um, okay, so the way this works is that, uh, maybe I'll go, I'll go backwards here. So if you want to request um, a slot for transmission, right? You want to download something, or you want to be able to send some data up, upstream. Okay, what you would do is you would send a request um, for the ability to transmit. Okay, so you would have these you have these mini slots containing requests for frames. So when you send uh, data, you would kind of randomly put a request in one of these slots. You could collide with other people requesting the slot, but the probability of that is low because these um, slots are so small, right? And there's only, you know, relatively few people requesting. You're not wasting a lot of, even if you do collide, you're not wasting a lot of bandwidth on that collision. Okay? It's, it's less expensive to collide on a request um, than to collide on, let's say, some big packet, data packet, or series of data packets being transmitted. Okay. So your request goes to the CMTS. The CMTS then transmits a map frame down to the people, assigning you certain slots um, for the upstream transmission. Okay, so you, first you request, then you wait for the map frame, and the map frame says, okay, you can get these slots for the transmission of data, and now you can put your data into these slots, and only you can use those, so there is no collision. Okay. So you have kind of all the principles in this network. You have frequency division between upstream and downstream. You have random access collision slots to request data. And then you have a coordinator that assigns non-collision slots for the actual data transmission in this network. It's actually a pretty, pretty clever system containing multiple principles. All right. And so that's a quick overview into uh, the medium access control protocols. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, we'll see you next week.